Good morning, everyone. My name is Stephen Aquario. I'm the Executive Director of the New York State Association of Counties. And on behalf of the NYSEC Board, Jack Marin from Ontario County, the Supervisor of the Town of Victor and Ontario County, uh, President of the Association of Counties, I'd like to thank everybody for joining us here. I'd also like to thank Matthew Chase. Matt Chase is the Executive Director of the National Association of Counties for this uh, historic partnership that we have here today in educating every single county in the state of New York, including the five boroughs representing New York City. Uh, we have the entire state on this call, uh, meaning that every county in New York State is represented on this call uh, from various uh, positions of administrative, fiscal, or departments of social services. Very pleased with everyone for me. We'll probably go an hour, an hour and a half, depending on your question, uh, that you'll have in this webinar uh, to provide counties with a federal update on Medicaid. Uh, the federal update will focus on the CMS, Federal Fiscal Accountability Rule. And if this is is enacted, this rule could impact how and counties finance program. And it did make aid and how this proposal actually affects in your our speakers for today's webinar. We're joined by Blair. www.nysec.org backslash Medicaid and the NACA NACO.org Questions by type questions at the dashboard. Again, uh, type the question to the dashboard. that by this week we will see some uh, changes, certainly some clarifications made in the state proposal to redesign Medicaid, and uh, we will continue to work with our governor and our state legislature to make sure that the concerns that we have expressed over these past few weeks are heard, listened to, and hopefully addressed as we go forward through this important budget uh, process in Albany. The state Medicaid program, of course, reporting a $6 billion gap in funding. That's a rather large number, even on a federal level. $6 billion certainly gets your attention. And so uh, for New York, uh, it will be a challenge, but we are up to this challenge, and we remain uh, a partner with the state uh, to preserve our Medicaid cap that we have right now. But before we get into the state proposal, let's go to our national counterpart, and Blair Bryant, let's go to you and your team in Washington, D.C., and we'll uh, go through your PowerPoint now. Thank you, Blair. 
Thank you, and good morning. Thank you, Steve, for that introduction, and big thank you to NISAC for coordinating this webinar and inviting NACO to participate and partner on these efforts. I know we got a pretty large group on today from various counties within the state of New York, and many of you are NACO members, so you are familiar with who NACO is and what we do. But for those of you who are unfamiliar, NACO is the voice for all 3,069 counties. And as our mission, NACO's goal is to achieve healthy, vibrant, and safe counties across our nation. To accomplish this, we're always working to both foster and strengthen our close ties on Capitol Hill and with the administration. We do this through input from you, the counties, our affiliates such as NISAC, and with the assistance of our partners that help us navigate specific policy issues on the federal level, such as McDermott Plus, who we're happy to have joining us on today for this discussion. So we'll move on to slide two. So before we jump into a discussion on how Medicaid is funded, let's take a step back and provide a bigger, big picture overview of what the program is and what it does. Medicaid is a federal entitlement program that provides health and long-term care insurance to low-income families and individuals. It's different from Medicare in how they're financed and the services that are provided to individuals. While Medicare is administered solely by the federal government, Medicaid operates and is jointly financed as a partnership between federal, state, and local governments. States administer the program often with assistance from counties with oversight by the federal government. Medicaid has traditionally served the elderly and disabled, as well as families, children, and pregnant women. However, as we know, the Affordable Care Act has given states the option to expand Medicaid coverage to nearly all low-income individuals. Currently, there are 37 states that have expanded Medicaid, of which New York is included. Moving on to slide three. So here's where counties fit into this. As I stated, the Medicaid program operates as a joint federal, state, and local partnership. The federal contribution rate for each state varies based on the federal medical assistance percentage rate, or the FMAP. The max amount contributed by each state is 50%, although some contribute as little as 26%. States with lower per capita incomes have a higher federal matching rate. Many states actually require counties to provide some sort of health care for low-income, uninsured, or underinsured residents, and counties do so by owning and operating hospitals, long-term care facilities, behavioral health centers, public health departments, and the like. The Medicaid program helps counties provide safety net programs for their residents in these settings, which helps to reduce the frequency of uncompensated care and lessens the strain on county budgets. And moving on to slide four but this is not a one-sided relationship. Counties make key financial contributions to the Medicaid program in conjunction with the state, and they often play a role in financing the non-federal share in their state, which is currently the case in 26 states, including New York. In fact, New York is one of 18 states that mandates counties to contribute to the non-federal share of Medicaid costs in other administrative program, physical health, and behavioral health care costs. Furthermore, New York has the highest mandated contribution in counties in your state send nearly $7 billion per year to the state for Medicaid costs. According to a report from the Henry J. Kaiser Foundation, in fiscal year 2012, counties contributed to $28 billion in the non-federal share of Medicaid. Most of these contributions were made through intergovernmental transfers, or IGTs, or from certified public expenditures, CPEs, in which a local government certifies its Medicaid expenditures to the state, and the state claims the federal Medicaid matching funds. Efforts to regulate and modify how the non-federal share of Medicaid is funded stem all the way back to the 1980s. However, recent attempts to change the financing structure have become more of a central focus in policy. And with that, I'd like to welcome Katie Waldo from McDermott Plus Consulting, who will talk a little about a little bit about legislative and administrative action aimed at changing this financing structure and followed by an overview of the Medicaid fiscal accountability rule proposal. Katie? Thanks, Claire, and it's great talking to you all today. So like Claire said, um, we'll just briefly go over some of the recent efforts, federal efforts to restructure the Medicaid financing uh, structure and then also do more of a deep dive into the Medicaid fiscal accountability rule, which we will uh, delightfully refer to, refer to as MFAR. So some of the most 
you know, recent efforts as it relates to changing Medicaid's financing structure, you know, really were stemming from the 2017 repeal and replace efforts. Um, there was a lot of um, structural changes within the Medicaid program within those efforts, specifically changing the Medicaid uh, program from a open-ended funding stream as it is today with the state and federal share to more of a block grant or a per capita cap structure. Um, a block grant um, is when a state gets a certain amount of money to administer the uh, Medicaid program, whereas a per capita cap is a set amount per beneficiary, which can um, basically increase or decrease as population changes. But we've seen the Trump administration uh, push states to, to implement block grants per capita caps, and most recently, uh, just either last week or two weeks ago, I'm, um, I'm getting my dates confused, uh, they released the Healthy Adult Opportunity Guidance, um, a state Medicaid director letter, which encourages states to implement a block grant or per capita cap through 1115 Medicaid waivers. It's important to note that with this recent guidance, it's not mandatory. Um, it's not something that can be uh, applied to all populations. It's, you know, mostly focused on non-mandatory adult populations, and specifically the um, expansion adult population, but a state is the one that has to actually implement um, a Medicaid block grant in order for it to, um, to be to be implemented. So um, I think the slides are jumping around a little bit, but if we can just go forward um, to slide five, I believe. Yeah, right here, is, that's, that's great. We'll stop here. Um, but mostly the our focus of our presentation is gonna be on the Medicaid Fiscal Accountability MFAR proposed rule. Um, so the MFAR rule, uh, came out in November. It's a proposed rule. Um, the comment period for the rule just closed um, in the beginning of February. So if it was something you were interested in, I hope you got your comments in by then. And ultimately what the regulation does is that it proposes significant changes to state reporting requirements as it relates to the supplemental payments. And then it also makes structural and definitional changes that can decrease states flexibility in generating their state share of the Medicaid um, Medicaid program. So basically limiting states ability to um, actually be able to generate their funding towards the Medicaid program. Can we go to the next slide. And I'll give a high level overview of what the MFAR regulation does, but I want to just stress before we get into the details that um, this, the changes that are made in MFAR are very dependent on the state and then also very dependent on a state and hospital's financial structure, and their relationship, um, and how they have actually structured their IGT, CPEs, provider level taxes, and provider related donations. All of that will impact. Um, how the MFAR regulation actually trickles down to the state and county level. Um, so it's, it is impossible to basically determine the overall effects of the MFAR regulation because it is so specific and unique based on each specific relationship. But needless to say, um, it will have significant effects across the country um, on states' ability to generate state share. So the first thing I'll, I'll talk about, though, is uh, what I think is the simplest thing to discuss regarding the MPAR regulation, which is the provider-level reporting requirements for states. The proposed rule um, outlines specific provider-level reporting requirements that states have to submit to the CMS, um, and it includes information, a lot of different data elements that are required. I've listed some of them here, um, specifically listing which providers receive supplemental payments, the specific amount that supple of supplemental payments that they've received, total dish payments, total Medicaid-based payments, 
there's a lot of data elements that are um, required. But ultimately, what this requirement does is, although it increases transparency of supplemental payments, which um, has not been captured yet in current Medicaid data sets, it also increases the scrutiny of supplemental payments. So with that, um, providers that receive supplemental payments, you know, have that have that flashlight um, set in on them as this information is is now be would now be required. And um, next slide. And um, well, before I move to this, I just want to note that there's also uh, financial penalties for states if they fail to meet uh, the reporting requirements as well. So not only are states required to report, but they could also receive financial penalties if, if they forget. But the real changes that we'll spend a little more time on going in um, in a little more detail are the structural and definitional changes to intergovernmental transfers, IGTs, certified public expenditures, CPEs, provider-related donations, and then also healthcare-related taxes. We go to the next slide. So, um, as Blair mentioned, an IGT is a, in its simplest definition, is a transfer of funds from one government entity to the Medicaid agency before Medicaid payment is made. Um, some of the changes that CMS have proposed is that an IGT must be derived from a state or local tax revenue. Um, CMS, in its proposed rule, noted that it believes that um, IGTs are not being derived, they're, they're being derived from other sources of revenue um, other than state and local tax. So this is technically, they're trying to crack down on that, um, making sure that IGTs are only applied to state and local tax revenue. And then it's also prohibiting non-bona fide provider-related donations to be a source of IGTs. I'll get into a little more detail on non-bona fide um, provider-related donations, but ultimately um, a non-bona fide related donation is a donation that a provider, you know, or tax, whoever you want to call it, um, gives to a state Medicaid agency, but then they get um, all or a portion of that money back. So in any situation in which a provider is getting all or a portion of the money back, directly or indirectly, that cannot be used as a source of an IGT under this proposed rule. We go to the next slide. They've also uh, proposed changes to certified public expenditures, CPEs. So these are expenditures made by a government agency under a, a state Medicaid plan. Um, and basically, they're also, like an IGT, eligible for federal match. The rule is proposing that a CPE payment can only be made to government providers. So that's state government providers, county providers, other non-state non government providers um, in, in this proposed rule. They're also proposing that CPE payments be um, limited to reimbursement that doesn't exceed the provider's actual cost of providing services to the Medicaid beneficiary. So services like administrative services or costs thus couldn't be included um, in the CPE payment. It has to be limited to the cost of providing services. They've also made change or proposed changes that um, change the cost protocols and methodologies for determining CPE payments, um, which are rather technical, um, but that is also included within the proposed rule. We go to the next slide. And also, the last two uh, bullets we've, we've combined here, um, but they've made changes to provider level donations and then healthcare taxes. Um, as it relates to uh, provider level or provider um, related donations, they are um, basically 
changing or revising the the definition of a um, bona fide uh, provider related donation. So they're looking at how uh, how that donation is is provided, and it must be truly voluntary. Um, and looking at the net effect or totality of the circumstances, meaning that if a provider related donation um, has any kind of money coming back to the provider, the provider gave its donation and it's received money back as a result of it, um, they'll be looking at the total, the total um, effect of that donation and then the entire circumstance of that relationship between the provider um, and the state Medicaid agency. Um, and in this situation, um, they would not, the provider, that provider tax or that donation would not be eligible for um, federal match. It only has to be truly voluntary and not, um, and there not be, I'll use the kickback as a term, but there can't be any um, money donations coming back to the provider as a result of the donation. Um, as it relates to healthcare related taxes, they're making what their CMS is calling or proposing some clarifying changes um, to determine when a tax is considered a healthcare related tax and when it is not. Um, ultimately, when they're changing these definitions of what is a qualified healthcare related taxes, what they're doing is that they're increasing CMS's authority to classify non healthcare related taxes as a healthcare related tax. So um, we could be seeing some changes based on that. But again, it's, all of this is dependent on the state and hospital's relationship and how you know, the state, county, hospital have um, organized their structure of raising the state share of, of the Medicaid, Medicaid um, funding. So that's at, a, that's at a very high level of the changes of what the MFAR regulation does. Um, we're happy to get into more details on that, and I know Blair is now gonna go into the details of like what is the actual implications of the MFAR regulation on counties. So I'll turn it back to Blair. Thanks, Katie. So as was mentioned, um, the impact would really base, be based on each state as each state's Medicaid program is different. However, I've tried to outline four ways that this rule would have a broad impact on the way that states and counties finance their Medicaid program. So first, the rule would definitely reduce flexibility for financing the non-federal share of state Medicaid programs. While the proposed rule seeks seeks to provide clarity on permitted sources of non-federal financing, it imposes somewhat of an intrusive level of control over state fund accounting. While the rule doesn't prohibit the use of IGTs and CPEs, tighter restrictions around what's permissible under these funding sources, of course, means that states and counties will have less options for financing their Medicaid program. In fact, some feel that the proposed rule departs from the original congressional intent of oversight and goes beyond the scope of CMS's legal authority as outlined in the Social Security Act, specifically Section 1903 of the Social Security Act, which prohibits the Secretary from restricting, restricting IGTs and CPEs derived from state tax revenues or appropriations to a state university teaching hospital, with the exception of funds transferred from non-recognized units of government. Secondly, the rule could result in diminished resources to support local healthcare systems. Given reduced financing flexibility, states and counties will have no choice but to reduce their spending on Medicaid programs. Fewer state and local dollars spent on Medicaid will mean fewer federal Medicaid matching funds and more significant cuts to Medicaid and the individuals that the program serves. In an analysis done by Minot, it was found that nationally, the Medicaid program could face a total of funding re reductions between 37 billion and 49 billion annually, or in other words, approximately six to 8% of total program spending. Moreover, Minot estimates that the impact on states would vary, but could be catastrophic for some states. Thirdly, the rule implements burdensome unfunded reporting requirements. Um, so Katie outlined all of the new reporting requirements proposed under this rule. As outlined, the proposed rule details new and substantial reporting requirements regarding upper payment limits 
and supplemental payments. Furthermore, these new reviews would be required every three years. The reporting requirements under the proposed rule will place significant administrative burden directly on counties that receive supplemental payments and administer the Medicaid program. To meet this new requirement, local governments will have to implement new data collection and reporting systems, which will require additional personnel, time, and funding. Because there was no indication of additional funding or technical assistance mentioned, there is a concern about the feasibility of these new requirements, especially given the stated penalty for failing to report timely, accurate, and complete data. Lastly, the rule would diminish confidence in the ability to meet federal requirements for financing state Medicaid plans as a result of unclear standards. Coupled with the burdensome reporting, reporting requirements, the proposal would also judge whether the mechanism is allowable using new undefined terms such as totality of circumstances, net benefit, undue burden, and reasonable expectations. These new authorities given to CMS are a form of open-ended discretion that would insert a large amount of uncertainty regarding states and counties' ability to maintain and make future changes to the program and respond to their community needs. Lastly, if it feels like there's still uh, uncertainties around the true impact of this policy, that is because it is. CMS confirms that the implications of these new policies on the Medicaid program, including future eligibility, benefits, provider payments, and access to care, is unknown. Should the financing arrangements of states be deemed unacceptable by CMS, local health care delivery systems will be forced to make difficult decisions and likely reductions to eligibility and the level of services that can be provided. So now that we know the impact of the proposed rule, I'm going to turn it over to Rodney to talk about where we go from here. Rodney? Sure. Okay, friends, thank you for having me here today. Where we are on this is that the regulation process is um, occurs in stages. First, you have a proposed reg, then we all read it, then we have a comment period, which has ended, and now CMS is reviewing the multitude of comments they have received, and at some point in time, they may issue a final regulation. That final regulation may be um, exactly as the proposed. It may have significant changes. It may even not come out. That has happened before. And what um, a number of folks throughout the safety net community are working towards is to try to uh, drastically affect, if not get CMS to realize this is too far, too fast, with too little evidence of what it will do. And we're working in the direction of working towards getting CMS to withdraw the regulation. Um, next slide. So the strategic approach and what we've been doing here, trying to, to again, um, the slide makes the point, make enough noise that CMS might make the loud noises go away. So Katie went through a lot of detail with you, as did Blair. Currently, you in the state of New York and every um, state in the union has, uh, a, has the ways they fund their own programs. The Medicaid statute gives states broad authority to fund their portion of the program in return for the federal government paying their share of the program. What this regulation is ultimately doing, it's going in and it's looking at all those ways that states do raise their own funds, and it is putting a number of them under question. What my recommendation to you to be doing right now is to look at the ways that you see that it could be problematic. if. Um, the state were told they could not, uh, um, the state could no longer use the mechanisms they're using and how that might affect you. And then it's a matter of communicating that to your members of Congress, hopefully to get them to weigh in with CMS. And the strategic approach that we've taken is, again, is just to flood the zone with noise. We want CMS to be hearing from a lot of people out there. We want the uh, members of Congress to hear a lot of people out there who are deeply concerned with the potential for disruption and the potential for um, having to find other ways to make up revenue or to make up shortfalls, which could involve changes in the way that you 
operate your taxes, or it could involve changes to benefits you provide to beneficiaries. So these are concerns that, that we're trying to express and, and make sure that um, Congress and the administration hear it. Where we can be helpful to you, working through Blair and the uh, good folks at NACO, is for us to, again, where we have concerns, that where we can help you amplify them to make sure that they are heard, um, to make sure that the the things that you see that could go wrong for you and, and could cause you to have to, again, make changes to your programs, that people who are, um, you know, particularly in Congress, realize that. That's a key to this entire thing, is for Congress, this is just Medicaid writ large. It's about making sure they understand this is the real consequence of what could happen here. And that's where your advocacy can make a real difference in helping us make the noise we need to hopefully um, ameliorate some of the potential damage that could be caused by this regulation. And with that, Blair, I think I've hit my end on the strategic and uh, can move in the direction of questions. Thank you. Um, and we are going to wait for questions to the very end, but I just wanted to make sure that everyone had all of our contact information. I know a number of you have already reached out to me with questions about MFAR, so please feel free to give me a call or shoot me an email. I've also placed Rodney and Katie's contact information on the screen as well. And with that, we will turn it back over to NISAC uh, for Dave's presentation. Thank you. Okay, Blair, uh, thank you, Katie and Rodney, Rodney as well. Um, uh, again, please submit your questions by typing them into the question section of the webinar dashboard, and we'll try to get to those questions. Uh, before we go to David Lucas uh, from the Association of Counties in New York on the state proposal, let's take a quick question, uh, Rodney, uh, for you. Um, do you have any more detailed examples of how CMS believes the states are illegitimately uh, deriving uh, their IGTs. Uh, I, do you have some examples of what the federal government has seen from the states? Are they, well, I'll leave it at that. Do you, do sure, you have any sure. uh, more detail? So, for, so if, for example, on tax rates, um, that uh, you know that there for years there have been a battle on how many are, are how much a state should be able to tax providers then to use to fund the federal share. Um, uh, goodness knows, as a former staffer, I was involved in one or two of those. And I think you're looking at, um, again, all types of the intergovernmental transfer arrangements. Um, in certain states, I won't call them out specifically, but Arizona could be one, where um, they um, have gone to great lengths to not refer to taxes as taxes um, and to uh, then skirt around the limitations that are used on tax rules. Um, we see a lot in the nursing home space as well, um, that where, um, where uh, CMS has done, uh, CMS is specifically targeting how the funds are moved there as well. Um, Katie, any of you would jump in on just thinking through the list as well? Yeah, as it specifically relates to IGTs, um, the CMS has been concerned that uh, the term public funds um, as it relates to IGTs is, you know, confusing or too broad. So that is why they are looking to explicitly say that IGTs need to be derived from um, state or local tax revenue instead of quote unquote public funds because um, they think there is you know, too much squishiness um, within that definition and that states are using other sources than state and local tax revenue um, to generate an IGT. Again, um, you know, like as Blair said, a lot of these changes give CMS um, a lot of increased authority and discretion in determining what is allowable and what is not. So that is a concern that, you know, that we have with, with all the changes as it relates to IGT, CPEs, provider-related donations, um, and healthcare taxes. So I hope that helps. Okay, uh, thank you. Let's, um, let's go to David Lucas now. Um, uh, uh, and then we'll pick up some of these questions. I see we have a couple more questions coming in on the federal side, but let's go to 
David Lucas will run till about noon, 12 o'clock, on the state presentation here now. And again, uh, the state of New York facing a, uh, a budget gap in its Medicaid program. And uh, we continue to work on a daily basis, on a regular basis, with the New York State Division of the Budget uh, folks and also with the governor's staff and the Department of Health to partner and join together through the Medicaid redesign team and work through the situation as governmental partners uh, at the county state level. Uh, Dave, perhaps you could relate a little bit about what was said with the federal changes. It seems the federal government looking to redesign the, the federal side of the Medicaid program. At the same time, the state of New York redesigning its Medicaid program uh, with waivers perhaps going back and forth between the states and the federal government. Perhaps you could relate it a little bit before you get into your New York presentation. Sure. Thank you, Steve. Uh, I also wanted to thank NACO, uh, Blair, and the McDermott folks, Katie and Rodney. Um, for those of you that are, aren't aware, the state uses a lot of these financing mechanisms. New York does pretty extensively. Um, we have a pretty robust health care provider tax system. We use certified public expenditures quite a bit in our waivers. Uh, IGTs, anybody with a nursing home or a hospital is doing dish payments and IGTs and using the upper payment limit. There's a lot of supplemental funding going through the state through Medicaid um, and through the pools where we collect all this in New York through the HICRA pools, you know, we're collecting five to six billion dollars annually in these types of financing resources, uh, including covered lives assessments. That is a big part of the financing on the state side of the program, and if there's further restrictions in this area from the federal government down to the state, it's really going to make the state's financial plan look a lot worse than it already is, uh, at least in regard to Medicaid. So um, thank you for the update, and we'll keep an eye on that uh, as we move forward. So as Steve mentioned, you know, the federal government's considering ways to um, redefine how states provide funding as match for the, the federal Medicaid match, the state is now kind of reviewing where it is at this time in this latest state budget proposal. Um, and as we've, we talked about previously, the state's facing a multi-billion dollar spending and funding gap, and I, I do have to emphasize spending. Um, they have a two, two-sided problem. They're overspending their agreed, agreed upon amount of not spending more than 3% from an inflationary perspective in Medicaid, they're overspending that, and they also have a revenue problem because they are overspending it by a lot, and there's not enough revenue to pay for it. So the governor's looking to potentially attack that on both sides to setting up a, another Medicaid redesign team. This would be the second one. Um, we did one in 2011 and 2012, and a, a lot of proposals were put forward, over 73 separate recommendations from what I recall, in 2012, with many of them being implemented. Uh, but he's looking for another MRT to come out and save $2.5 billion on a recurring basis. And actually, that recurring amount is expected to grow going forward each year a little bit. Um, and the other major proposal in the governor's budget is to get another $150 million each year out of the counties of New York City and more Medicaid match. Um, so there's three primary proposals, next slide please, that is in the budget. And um, the first proposal is the governor um, wants to cap the amount of enhanced federal Medicaid match that um, comes to the counties. Uh, this is, there's a lot of words on this slide and it's a little complicated, but at the end of the day, what happened under the Affordable Care Act, uh, the federal government decided to do two things. They decided to provide an enhanced match for states that chose to expand eligibility about, beyond certain levels. Um, a, a handful of states had already done that prior to the enactment of the Affordable Care Act, and there were special credits provided, for lack of a better term, in the federal law that would allow those states to benefit from these new, these new higher federal match rates um, so they were returned back to these few states that had expanded ahead of time, and New York was one of them. Um, and going back to the ARA days, um, right after the um, fiscal crisis in the late 2000 aughts, um, there was enhanced Medicaid matching provided to help stem 
the recession um, as an, a fiscal incentive and to help states not have to cut more programs. That enhanced Medicaid match when it was provided in New York was passed through directly to counties because we're a payer. Um, unlike in other states, we're, we're pretty predominant payer in the system. And our congressional delegation wanted to make sure that any enhanced Medicaid matching rates would be passed through. The ACA continued that. Um, and today, we're, counties are receiving, well, as of about three years ago, I have to clarify, we were receiving about $500 million in federal savings from, from that provision. Um, the enhanced FMAP is usually reconciled each year along with other components of the Medicaid uh, program. They're three years behind right now, two and a half, let's say, um, in those reconciliations. So as of a few years ago, the savings was about $500 million. If, it, if you brought it up to today, if those reconciliations had been concluded, uh, we estimate that somewhere around $700 million is, is the fiscal benefit to counties in New York City from the federal enhanced FMAP. So the governor is proposing to cap that FMAP benefit and redirect the cap savings back to the state. Um, that's his first proposal. It would be effective April 1st, 2020. There's no clear indication in the budget documents about how expensive or how much savings this would provide to the state. Um, it's not clear if it's retroactive and they would claw back all of that potential savings or if it would only be perspective or some combination. We've, we have not gotten any clarification of how they would do that. The second major component is pretty self-explanatory. Um, you have to stay under the Medicaid cap. Next slide, thank you. Um, if you don't stay under your property tax cap, whatever that amount is, you could potentially lose your federal or your state savings from the existing Medicaid caps uh, within the state. Um, there is a you know, good cause waiver application a county could provide if there's some unique circumstance going on as the reason why they exceeded the cap. Um, the city has indicated that this is a potentially a big problem. We have a $1.1 billion number in this slide, but we, we have received a, a clarification from the state on what their interpretation is, and, and that fiscal impact could be smaller than that. Um, but I'm not going to speak for the city at this point, but we have gotten some clarification, but it's still a really giant number. And third, the next slide, the major, this next proposal is one that's causing quite a bit of confusion just because of the verbal explanation versus how the bill language is drafted. They really don't match up. Um, so what this proposal would say, even if you do stay under your 2% property tax cap, you could potentially be penalized if you if your local cost and the associated savings grows by more than three percent in any given year, the county would be responsible for paying back anything over the three percent. Um, there's no clear uh, definition of how that mechanism would work. Would counties be refunding money back to the state, or would they adjust weekly shares going forward? We just don't know how that would work. Um, and based on the data we've collected from counties, we think that nearly every county would be negatively impacted from this proposal, just the 3% proposal. The other two proposals are a whole other layer of potential negative consequences. Uh, next slide. We have co collected data from counties. Uh, again, um, the language is not totally clear on what's the starting point and the data set we're supposed to be using, but after consulting with DSS commissioners and other, other county FISLA experts, um, counties were able to provide some data back to us here. We, can, we collected it. Um, for the most recent year, had this proposal been in effect, we think that um, the negative impact on counties would have been about $121 million in 2019, uh, 248 million in 2018, and we do have five-year average data back um, for at least 20 counties to 2014-15 state fiscal year. And if you look at the average over that five-year period, the negative impact's about $162 million. So it's it's a pretty big proposal in and of itself, just this 3% this one. Um, and that leads us to the next question. You know, part of the argument has been 
costs have been exploding on the state side, and the, the governor wants counties to be more invested in trying to control those costs. Um, as the previous slide kind of highlights, when you go back five years when costs were sort of considered to be under control, there's still very large negative impacts for the county. So uh, I'm not sure if uh, the rhetoric matches exactly uh, what's going on, especially with how the language is interpreted. Um, but then that leads us to this, this slide here of, you know, what do counties really control? And there's, there's just a lot of things that are out of the control of not just the state, but the counties as well, as far as inputs into the system. Uh, reimbursement rates for healthcare providers uh, aren't controlled by counties. The cost of a lot of the inputs, like prescription drugs and durable medical equipment. The demographics of a county, how, how the aging, um, how many disabled folks there are, rates of illness, the incidence, prevalence, and morbidity. It, those are hard things to control for anybody. Everybody struggles with that. Um, the minimum wage increase is something that, you know, that is kind of plateauing at this point in time, but it, it is a big impact on the system. Um, and even the timing of payments and billings within the system, the, the data we use to make our analysis is cash-based. Um, so it's when a provider gets paid and submits bills can influence uh, how much the cost growth is in any given year or month. And, of course, benefit design and eligibility, for the most part, are some things that the counties can't directly control. Um, so we'll end it there and see if there's any questions um, on anything within the presentation today. Um, first question, do our New York State lawmakers and their staff know about these federal changes? As they can, as they consider how to deal with um, the executive budget plan, these changes could be even more damaging to counties. I, I don't. And this is Dave Lucas. I, I'm not sure. I'm sure they're tracking it. And um, as Rodney mentioned, and, and Katie, you know, we're in draft proposal at this time, and it could change in its, its final release, um, and it may not get released at all, but um, I think this administration in D.C. right now has been following through on most of their proposals in some form, um, but I, given the amount of revenue the state raises from these, these other financing mechanisms, they, they must be watching this closely. Uh, and they do have obvious positions on things that have been posed in the past regarding Medicaid block grants, and they have clearly opposed to those types of initiatives, um, statutorily or administratively. Uh, Dave, you said that your uh, the data we have it comes from 40 counties. How can we get the other 17 counties to provide us with data so we can flesh out that that database? We're encouraging counties to submit their information. Now, I will say the 40 counties have submitted data, uh, data to us uh, in the most recent year represent about 80% of all Medicaid spending. So the counties that are left, you know, there's a couple of bigger ones in there, but most of the rest are pretty small, and we could probably um, extrapolate beyond that. But we would love to have a broader data set, and we are, are continue to reach out to counties. Uh, here's a good question, uh, Dave. What if, if the state is successful in uh, retaining the EF map money? Uh, will that impact weekly shares, and then will that then impact um, the local growth over three percent? Yeah, depending on how they um, implement that proposal, my guess is the currently the enhanced EF map is provided to counties through a reduction in our weekly shares. So if they were to capture more of the EF map savings for themselves, the state, my guess is at this time, I don't know for sure, is that they would adjust it by increasing weekly shares. And that raises two questions. Um, could the increase in weekly shares be big enough to force a county to exceed its 2% property tax cap? It's a possibility, depending on how much um, is clawed back by the state. Um, or could it impact the 3%? Uh, it's, it's not clear to me if it may even actually reduce the impact on the 3% um, the way we analyze the savings. Um, but it, it's, it's unclear at this time. 
Okay, um, the next question is about slides. These slides will be um, posted on the website this afternoon, and then we will be uh, recording this webinar. This webinar is being recorded, and that will be made available as, as soon as we can uh, render that and post it to uh, NYSEC uh, TV on YouTube. Um, next question um, is, is there any chance that this uh, will be part of his 30-day amendment? So we've asked him to remove, uh, we've asked the governor and the Division of Budget to remove um, uh, this section of the, the budget during the 30-day amendments, Part R of the budget language in the 30-day amendments, and we will know uh, Friday afternoon, late Friday afternoon, uh, whether or not that is uh, part of the 30-day amendments. We expect some changes, but we don't know what those changes will look like. Um, okay, so um, again, thank you, Mark, and uh, if you have questions, please send them in. Um, there's another question here, is there a real basis, I'm not sure if, if we've hit this one yet, Mark, nope. uh, to the concern that CMS is overstepping its authority uh, with some of these federal changes? Uh, will New York State sue the federal government over some of these changes if they, in fact, find it to be, have a negative impact? Uh, on that. I guess uh, Dave is giving me an indication here that we can't respond for the state, but we are going to be uh, calling the state and working, more importantly, partnering with the state on any category where there's a, a negative impact, um, you know, to New York State and ask them how we can jointly uh, bring about um, uh, uh, the concerns to the federal government and partner with the state with these federal changes. Uh, did NACO uh, respond uh, to the to the federal changes, Blair? Was there any sort of, uh, uh, on behalf of all the counties from across the United States, has NACO uh, submitted comments to the rule? Yes, we did submit comments to the rule by the deadline. Um, with regards to the question about challenging um, the legality of CMS's new proposed rule and them overstepping their boundaries, we do, like we said, we don't know if the rule will be finalized and posted yet, um, but if it does, we do anticipate there to be legal challenges uh, to that rule. Okay, thank you. Uh, um, let's uh, go to Rodney uh, or Katie. Will the federal regulation changes result in a reduction of available IGT funding? I think that's absolutely the intent of the regulation is to change the nature of it. Um, but one of the things and why it will ultimately be very litigious is that it will be on a case by case basis. One of the reasons why this has been slow to percolate in our space is that it is not so overtly um, concerning as hearing the word block grant. I mean, block grant means panic. This is extremely complicated. The regulation, when you read it, is very much of a you know it when you see it kind of thing. And it's been very difficult for people to go into this and say, this is targeting me. This is a problem. I've, I've literally had folks in the safety net space you know, read something and go, do you think they were talking about, you know, my arrangement specifically? It, we're going to go through a process of figuring out oh, uh, if this is um, moved forward as is uh, of having to figure out exactly what uh, CMS means to do, and you should expect it to be litigious down to, the, uh, down to the state level, and we will know more specifically IGTs as a state goes to get one approved and this and the news. CMS reg is in place and they say yes or no at that point. Okay, uh, next question here. Again, if you have a question, uh, please type them into your question section of the webinar dashboard. Uh, this question here, uh, Dave, uh, maybe at NYSEC you could answer, how could increasing the local share of Medicaid reduce the local cost that counts toward the 3% cap? There's a lot of language in that little question there. Yeah. Uh, it, can, how do you respond to that question? There is an interpretation of the way we're 
interpreting the, the legislative language, there is a 3%, the, the state describes it as a 3% increase in cost, but in reality, when we read the statutory language, we believe it's a 3% increase in the net savings that accrues to a county. So if the state adjusts FMAP upward in any given year, it would probably reduce the net savings the county would experience in that year. Um, so you might not have, instead of having 5% net savings growth, you might only have 3% because the net savings is derived from how much did you contribute in your weekly shares during the year. Um, so we're thinking it, there could be not a balance between it, but the impact could be reduced potentially in the county. If your net savings increase by 25%, and in some counties it does year to year, obviously paying a little bit more your weekly shares is not going to save you from that um, that outcome. But there are some that are just three or four percent that might be close where it could make a difference. Okay, we're coming up on the hour here. We'll try to get a couple of more questions. Again, back to the state proposal. Um, will the governor? The question is, will the governor be changing? the Medicaid proposal that he originally submitted as part of the executive budget uh, proposal to the state legislature. I guess we, I guess we can't answer that question. Um, what we believe is that the concerns from the counties uh, have been transmitted, uh, that the budget director himself has been very open and accessible in meeting with us and working with NISAC and with county officials trying to explain the proposal, and I believe that the concerns that we have uh, collectively brought to the state's attention are being listened to, and it is our hope that uh, some of these uh, concerns, if not all of them, will be addressed in a budget amendment. Uh, this week, uh, we expect by Friday to have budget amendments uh, are required by law to be submitted. Uh, within 30 days of the budget submission, so that would mean this Friday the state budget would have to change. We're not sure uh, what the governor will do, uh, but we're hopeful that they will make some uh, adjustments to the proposal uh, and, and, uh, and continue to work with the counties uh, on, the, um, on, the, on the proposal. And, and the next question that we have uh, deals with the MRT. What is its role? Um, with county Medicaid, Dave, maybe you could take that question. How does the, what role is the MRT? Uh, what role does it have for county operations? It seems like we're limited in enrollment right now to persons with disabilities and long-term care eligibility certification. Uh, could the MRT change the role of counties? Uh, I guess in theory it could. Um, the part of the base instructions from the governor um, first were the MRT shouldn't impact beneficiaries, and they also shouldn't impact local governments. Um, so to the degree of what they mean by not impacting local governments, is it from an administrative perspective or from a fiscal perspective? It's unclear. Clearly, in the other part of the budget, they've already impacted local governments fiscally through the three proposals we just talked about. But could they expand the authority of uh, the local districts to have more audit capacity or to look more closely at certain things when they're enrolling people? Um, they probably could provide that type of um, authority to counties. Um, last time the MRT met, they really didn't do that, though. They sort of centralized that authority at the state level uh, more so than you know, disbanding it out to the counties or decentralizing it. Something they could do, I'm, I'm not, it's not clear to us if they would. Though. Okay, the next question is, didn't the state of New York implement uh, an administrative takeover uh, of a Medicaid uh, from the counties a few years back? What is the status of the Medicaid administrative takeover? Is the state of New York administering Medicaid? Uh, Dave, I guess that question would go to you. Who's yeah. administering what, I guess, is the question here. Yeah, it really depends on the county. The, the original idea from the state that was enacted in the law was that the state would complete the full takeover of Medicaid administrative costs from the counties sometime during 2018. But 
clearly they did not meet that goal, uh, and a lot of it uh, was technology-based, and the initial way they they did the administrative takeover was the things they could centralize and automate, they did, um, and that was some of the easier parts of the program, and then they, they implemented on a rollout basis to counties, so some counties were first into the, the new model and others were later added to the model. So it really varies by county. But right now, typically the state does about 60% of all enrollments uh, through the New York State Health Exchange. Upstate. Upstate. Um, actually, that's statewide. In an upstate, it's pretty much two out of three, but it really depends on the county. The closer you are to New York City, the four big suburban counties, um, the State's doing three out of four enrollments based on DOH data that we have available to us. So it's a pretty big mix out there. Having said that, the state, at least in discussions we've had with the Division of the Budget, they don't anticipate being able to take over the rest of the administrative functions anytime soon. Okay. Um, Gabe, the next question maybe to you again, but on the state side again here, is what is the timeline for the MRT? I've, based on what we've heard, and we think that the, the MRT needs to have proposals back to the state sometime in mid-March at the latest um, for review. Is there legislative action that needs to happen? Yeah. Or can this be done administratively? I think, um, I think they're anticipating statutory changes about the need to have it prior to April 1st because it could incorporate it into the budget. Um, Okay. That would be my guess. Last time the MRT, the first round of MRT, there were a lot of statutory changes that were enacted to, to implement the, the recommendations. Okay, the next question here is uh, um, we have a relatively large nursing facility that we currently fund with an IGT. Uh, could the federal regulations cause us to increase positions to fulfill the new reporting requirements? I guess, Rodney, that might be a question to you or Katie. Uh, I'd, uh, and increased physicians, uh, that one I don't necessarily see. Katie, do you, does anything jump out to you how you could back your way into that? Um, I don't think that relates to that. Katie? Yeah, I'm I'm not sure I I understand, um, you know, kind of the, the origin of that question. So, no, I, I, I'm not sure. This is Blair uh, from NACO. Um, I think I understand the question regarding the increased amount of reporting requirements um, on agencies that receive supplemental payments. Um, I guess the question is, do, will more staff time be needed and more staff be needed to fulfill these requirements? And the answer is maybe, um, but there certainly isn't any funding for that. So that will be up to the uh, county's discretion to hire more staff to fulfill that requirement. So if that's so, if it's the question is on reporting. It's not the provider that does the reporting. It's actually the state. So the state is the one with the onus on actually submitting the additional information that will be required under MFAR through. It's something called the CMS 64. It's a quarterly report that states have to submit, and this that reporting requirement would have additional data variables there. But, you know, they're getting down to the provider level detail, but it's not the provider that has to do the reporting. It's the state. It's on the, the state Medicaid agency to do that reporting. So if anything, it's the state needs to look at their data capabilities in order to do the reporting rather than the provider themselves. Yeah. Okay, I guess to close here, one of the questions is what are the next steps here uh, in this process, both at the federal level and at the state level? Uh, um, I'll let Blair close with maybe next steps at the federal level with IGT. We did see Rodney had a slide in there about um, the proposed regulation, the comment period ending. Uh, but before I turn it over to Blair to close on that question, for New York uh, state side, uh, again, uh, we'll be working with the Division of the Budget um, very closely and with the Governor's Office on the present proposal. 
We're in communicating with them in good faith on both sides uh, to address the Medicaid gap and partner with them. Our concerns are, are being addressed in that on Friday of this week, by noon, any ideas for Medicaid redesign team consideration must be submitted by 12 noon. So if you want to submit them to the portal, uh, uh, you have to do that by noon. And um, the link that was distributed earlier uh, is being uh, administered by the Medicaid redesign team. That's a MRT link that's being administered by New York State and not NISAC, just to be clear on that link earlier um, with that communication. So uh, after that, we continue to encourage our members to talk with uh, their state legislators and communicate with the governor's office about your concerns about the Medicaid proposal. Uh, this is going to be a budget that will get done. Uh, we have a, a short time frame this year, so third week in March, things will probably close down about three weeks from now. So we got a lot of work to do to get there. Let me turn to you, Blair, about next steps at the federal side. Thank you. Um, just to reiterate some of the things that have already been mentioned regarding the federal process. So the comment period closed uh, on February 1st for this proposed regulation. As I mentioned, NACO did submit comments on behalf of all counties trying to um, express some of those broader impacts uh, that would affect all counties. So. And we hope that um, each county and each state individually submitted comments on their own, talking about the specific impacts to their financing mechanisms. So we're kind of in the waiting game to see if the final rule um, comes out later on this year. In the meantime, I would um, encourage you to continue to explore how this rule would impact your own state's financing structure and your county's financing structure for the Medicaid, the non-federal share of Medicaid. Um, and then also we will watch and see what happens once the rule um, hits the register and see if there will be any legal implications for the rule um, and keep you posted on that. Okay, that will conclude today's webinar. I want to thank Blair Bryan from the Association of Counties, the National Association of Counties. Thank Rodney Whitlock and Katie Waldo from McDermott and Consulting. Uh, for their federal presentation and, and, of course, to David Lucas from NISAC on the state update. Uh, we'll continue to provide information on action alert updates to the county members, and thank you again for weighing in with this issue, both with our governor and with your state legislator. Thank you very much.